scripture reading for today is Mark 12, 1 through 12. If you don't have a Bible, you are free to take one from the pews. Please stand for the reading of God's word. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so, with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Let's pray. Now, Father, how sweet it is to worship you and your Son and your Spirit. And we give you thanks for the many spiritual blessings that you've given us that we are free to exercise this very morning. And we ask you for one more thing. That as we've turned to your word and examined this teaching of your son, that you would give us perception and apprehension of it, that we would comprehend it and that it would result in great fruit in our lives. Lord Jesus, your name is beautiful indeed. We've gathered in your name and we're here to worship you we're here to proclaim your word. And precious spirit of truth, we pray that you come among us, especially this morning. Help me to stand out of the way of your word. And, and we pray that those who require conviction receive it and that those who need encouragement receive that as well. We could not understand the word were it not for your work in us. And so we ask you, Spirit of Truth, come. Come among us this morning. We ask all of these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you for making it out this morning, despite the couple of inches of snow. Um, we are looking at the continuation of a conversation that began in the passage we looked at last week. Uh, you recall that as Jesus was teaching in the temple, the temple that he had previously cleansed, uh, the members of the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, scribes, and elders come to him and they question Jesus' authority, his authority to teach in this temple, his authority to cleanse the temple. And Jesus responds with a counter question, a question of his own, and he asks these religious elites, uh, these clergymen, he says, is the ministry of John the Baptist from God or is it from men? That is, is this something John came up with on his own? And these experts in the Bible, 
got together in conference with one another and in what has to be one of the most pathetic moments in the history of Israel's leadership, they respond by saying, I don't know. We don't know if he was a prophet from God or not. So corrupt is the leadership of Israel that they aren't even able to recognize a prophet to be a prophet. Uh, That is a situation decidedly worse than uh, some of the other prophets in the Old Testament. The passage we're looking at this morning is a continuation, as I mentioned, of that very same conversation. This conversation occurs on the Wednesday before Jesus is crucified. And so now Mark is zooming in on this last week of our Lord's ministry, and Jesus tells these same members of the Sanhedrin a parable. Now, let me mention a thing or two about parables. A parable is a story that serves as a vehicle to convey some truth or to make some kind of point. Uh, Jesus' parables were always taken from things that would have been very familiar uh, to his first century audience. Uh, That is why often there are agrarian concepts in Jesus' parables, because it was an agrarian culture. But there's a very common misconception that I think probably 99% of people have about the parables of Jesus. Most people think Jesus' parables were just quaint stories that were used in order to help everyone understand what he was talking about. That's what most people think. Most people think Jesus was using parables so that everyone could grasp what he was teaching. That is simply not the case. That is not why Jesus taught in parables. He taught in parables so that certain people wouldn't understand what he was teaching. And we saw that earlier in Mark's gospel, in Mark chapter 4, when Jesus tells the parable of the soils, his disciples don't understand it, and they come to him for an explanation. And Jesus says, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables so that they may see and not perceive, and they may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And so Jesus' teaching in parables is at once a blessing of God upon those who believe and a judgment of God upon those who don't. It is both the revelation of divine truth for some and the obscuring of God's truth for others. Uh, This is a good example of God's sovereign election, His, His special grace. However, there is one exception to that rule, that His parables were meant to obscure the truth from the unbeliever. There's one exception, and it's our passage. Jesus intended in this one occurrence for these men to understand exactly what he was talking about, because he was talking about them. This is the one time when Jesus expects the unbeliever to get his drift in terms of this parable. So let's Look at this passage closely, and uh, we'll read the parable, then we'll go back and, and take a closer look at it. Mark chapter 12 and verse 1. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the winepress and built a tower, and he leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him, and they beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Again he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed, and so with many others. Some they beat, and some they killed. He still had one other, a beloved son. And finally he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those... Tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him, and they killed him, and threw him out of the guard, uh, out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? Jesus asked. He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. This is the parable, uh, and so let's 
let's take it line by line here and see what we can find. Jesus begins, a man planted a vineyard. Winemaking in ancient Israel was ubiquitous. Uh, it was extremely common. Part of the reason for that is that Israel's terrain really lended itself to winemaking. And would, were you to go to Israel today, you would see uh, an extraordinary number of vineyards that are currently operating. And then you would also see the ruins of many uh, ancient vineyards as they were terraced on the hillside. Uh, wine was a part of Israelite culture. It was part of Hebrew culture. And, and went all the way back to at least Noah, who once the floodwaters subsided, he worshipped and the first thing he did was plant a vineyard. Uh, drinking wine and making wine was considered a, a good thing to do in uh, Hebrew culture. Uh, the kings of Israel were said to have vast stores of wine. They were said to have uh, many, many vineyards. Um, but in Jesus' day, most individuals did not own a vineyard. Rather, uh, vineyards were owned predominantly by a community, sort of like a community farm, or the state. But if you had a vineyard, uh, that, you were considered very prosperous and, and doing quite well. Vineyards obviously produce wine, although there have been some in evangelicalism that have suggested otherwise. There's one quarter of evangelicals who think for some reason that it is inherently wrong or immoral to drink wine or really any other alcoholic beverage. And the way that they get around passages like this, passages where Jesus turns water into wine and drinks wine, they want to say that that is, in fact, not fermented wine, but uh, grape juice. And I want to tell you that although people say that on the Internet, and although there are some churches who teach that, there is absolutely no evidence for that. And in fact, there is a mountain of evidence in the opposite direction. Uh, it is very, very clear in the Greek language of the New Testament that there are perfectly suitable words for grape juice. And then there are words for wine. And repeatedly in the New Testament, the terms used to describe what is translated wine is alcoholic wine. And we need to remember that the Bible, when it talks about wine or alcoholic beverages more generally, it does so mainly in very positive terms. Uh, that is to say that the drinking of alcoholic beverages, as long as it's within the bounds of the law, is not sinful. That's a common misconception. Now, we dare not make a law where God has not made a law. And the way the Bible talks about the drinking of alcohol usually is in positive terms, such that uh, the drinking of alcohol is looked at as a good gift from God. For example, Psalm 104 says, uh, Speaking of Yahweh, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and the plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man. Ecclesiastes 9, 7 says, Go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart. It's not as though God is somehow ignorant of the fact that alcoholic beverages affect the body. Uh, God is not like, he didn't see that coming. Uh, that is obviously the case. And in fact, uh, with certain parameters, there is nothing wrong about that. There's nothing wrong with having a few alcoholic beverages. What is wrong, and is really wrong biblically, is drunkenness. And I understand very well that in our culture, to be drunk is something of a joke. It's socially acceptable at this point in certain situations. You know, if you're heartbroken, you get drunk. If you're partying, you get drunk. If you're having a difficult time, you get drunk, and it's looked at like it's okay. And I want you to know that it's not okay. It's a very serious sin. When the Bible talks about drunkenness, it puts it in vice lists next to murder and adultery and, and really serious top shelf sins. And so what I would say to you is, while the Bible does afford us uh, the, the Christian liberty to participate in drinking alcoholic beverages, it absolutely forbids drunkenness. And so wisdom is required. Paul says... 
For us, everything is permissible, but not everything is profitable. And if you're not too high up on the self-control ability scale, you might want to reconsider the drinking of alcohol, because that is what it requires. And really, every area in our life requires self-control. What you eat requires self-control. Even how much you exercise requires self-restraint. And the kind of things that come from drunkenness are utterly destructive, which is why the Bible so clearly prohibits it. When Paul says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, he is contrasting the life of the drunkard with the life of the Christian. They're incompatible. How many livelihoods and careers has drunkenness destroyed? How many marriages and how many families has drunkenness torn apart? I would venture to say everyone in this room knows someone like that, whose family, or maybe it was your family, has been ravaged by the sin of drunkenness. How many lives have been taken prematurely by drunkenness? Whether through the ramifications of persistent drunkenness to the body, or whether through drunk driving or some other accident like that. And so this is a very serious sin, and, uh, and so we have to take an even-handed approach when it comes to the drinking of alcohol. But Jesus certainly drank wine, and you need to know that when Jesus established the Lord's Supper, he established it with wine. They weren't drinking grape juice at the Last Supper. Uh, they had wine and bread, and so the drinking of wine is codified in the Christian faith which is why it is really uh, silly to suggest that any alcohol is sinful. Uh, But we must take care to realize the the danger of drunkenness. So this man plants a vineyard. That would require that he purchased a piece of land, uh, that he cleared the land, that he prepared the ground, planted the grapevines, and uh, likely built some kind of trellis for the vines to grow up and uh, to be able to mature. He built a fence around it. Uh, The underlying Greek there has literally a hedge, some kind of natural barrier, maybe a stone wall or bushes or trees in order to outline his property and distinguish it from the surrounding property. He dug a pit for the wine press. Um, It's interesting, in the ancient uh, world, uh, there were so many wine presses that a fair amount of them have survived in our day. Uh, Usually, they were uh, rectangles, uh, 10 to 15 feet uh, long, and about three uh, three to four feet deep, depending on uh, the style of wine press, and they would be terraced or on a grade. And what you would do is you would take the harvest of grapes, you'd put it on the high end of the wine press, and you would very joyously stomp on the grapes staining your feet purple. In in Jewish culture, that was considered a great time. Like, that was good evidence of the Lord's blessing upon you, that you had a harvest of grapes to turn into wine. And then the juice would run down, separated from the fruit, and you would collect it into jars and then later ferment it. And so that's what the wine press is for. He also built a tower. Uh, This tower would likely have been used as a residence for whoever was going to watch over the wine, uh, the, the, uh, the vineyard. Uh, it would also be used to store whatever tools and equipment was needed to care for the vineyard. And then this man, having outfitted this entire place, having made this very significant investment in this vineyard, uh, he leased it to tenants and went on a long journey. Um, Winemaking in general, is really expensive. And this is true in the ancient world. There are several ancient accounts that uh, attest to this. Winemaking is difficult. It's time-consuming. It takes, on average, three years at minimum for uh, grapevines to mature to the point where you can then collect the appropriate fruit and make wine from them. And uh, it's just very labor-intensive, which is why, uh, and I've heard this said, that today, if you have a large fortune uh, and you're interested in winemaking, uh, you can establish a vineyard and uh, do, get all the equipment, and at the end of it all, 
uh, what you will end up with is a very small fortune as a result because it's not a very profitable endeavor. Um, but this man does it, and uh, he builds this uh, vineyard well, outfits it with all of the things needed, and then he leases it to tenants. Uh, this would have been an arrangement that uh, was similar to sharecropping. These tenants would take residents up in the tower uh, or surrounding the, the vineyard, and uh, when the fruit matured over a course of years, they would get a share of the fruit and the landlord would come and get a share of the fruit. And so this landowner went off into another country. It would have taken a considerable amount of time to go anywhere, really, because there's no mechanized transportation. And so he needed men to work his vineyard in his absence. Now, what you should know is, or at least think about, Jesus is telling this account to these chief priests, scribes, and elders. And you can imagine the look on their face. They would look at this scenario with approval. Like, this is a really good idea. This guy is sharp. He's a good businessman. Uh, he knows what he's doing. They would be even envious of his ability to put together this vineyard. What they would also probably realize is that this language that Jesus uses sounds a lot like another place in the Bible, namely Isaiah chapter 5. And I would venture to say that these men who spent their entire lives studying the Bible, studying the Old Testament, would have instantly realized the, the, the similarities between what Jesus says in this parable and what God says in Isaiah chapter 5. I'll just read that for you. Isaiah chapter 5 is an oracle of judgment on Judah. And this is what it says, Let me sing for my beloved my song, my love song, concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and he hewed out a wine vat, that is uh, essentially a wine press and a place to collect the juice. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. That is, grapes that are completely unsuitable for consumption. Uh, you can't do anything with wild grapes. Even certain kinds of wild grapes, if you throw them on the ground, it'll ruin the soil. What God is saying in that passage is that I've done everything I can for Judah, and more generally, Israel. I've established them as a nation... They were slaves. They weren't a nation. But I brought them out of Egypt with many miraculous signs. I've given them my presence. I've given them their own land where they could be free. And I have made preparation for their blessing. And the only thing they've done is produce rotten fruit. That's what Isaiah 5 is saying. And what we will see is Jesus is going to be saying much the same thing with regard to the leaders of Israel. And so going back to our parable, this landlord leases the property to tenants. And he goes off, verse 2, when the season came, that is some years later after these vines had time to ripe, ripen and, and develop, he sent a servant, better translated slave, to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. This landlord is depicted as a very even-handed man. He's not uh, looking to take all of the proceeds, despite the fact that it is his land. He's reasonable and fair. He's looking to get some of the fruit, as was agreed upon. And so he sends a slave. In the ancient world, when one sent a messenger... It was commonly understood that you are to treat the messenger the same way that you would treat the one who sent the messenger. Maybe you've read stories about king's messengers and how you were supposed to revere and protect the messenger of the king even if you didn't like the king because how you treated the messenger was how you were going to treat the king. This guy sends a slave. He's the landlord. They're supposed to treat the slave in the same way they would treat the landlord. 
But they took him, verse 3, and they beat him and they sent him away empty-handed. So this is sort of doubly sinful. Not only did they beat this man, who was just a slave doing his uh, duty here, they sent him away empty-handed as if to say, this isn't your vineyard anymore. It was a double affront to the landlord. As Jesus told this story to these members of the Sanhedrin, to these priests and, and to these scribes and elders... You could imagine that they would begin to become indignant about what these tenants have done. After this man has made all of this provision and and developed all of this uh, infrastructure for this vineyard, for them to turn around and to beat his slave and to throw him out empty-handed is just the height of, of wickedness. It's absolutely incomprehensible. Verse 4. Again he sent to them another slave. And they struck him on the head. The language there literally is, they gave him a head injury. They didn't just hit him on the head. No, he walked away with an injury. They struck him on the head, and they treated him shamefully. Mark is being modest here. How did they treat him shamefully? You can imagine. They treated him in a a depraved and perverse way. You can imagine these Sanhedrin men listening to this thinking, this is unbelievable. And just put yourself in the position of that landowner. This is your vineyard, you bought it, you uh, put everything there, you made all the provision, it's your investment... And you sent one slave to get what's yours, and they beat him. You sent another slave, and now they've done worse to him. Brothers, what are you going to do if you're living in the ancient world? Because there's no police system here. It's not like you could go down to the local precinct and say, this is what's happening. There's none of that here. You've got you've to handle this yourself. There's no uh, authorities that you can uh, involve unless you bribe them. Brothers, you know what you're going to do. You're going to go... You're going to get your, your, your buddies, you're going to get your sons, you're going to get your weapons, and you're going to go down there and throw those tenants out, if not kill them. And if you lived in the ancient world, that's exactly what you would do. Anyone would do that in this scenario. That's what these Jews are expecting Jesus to say following this. But unbelievably, verse 5, he says... And he sent another. At this point, they would have turned their attention not to the wicked tenants, but to the landowner thinking, who in their right mind would send another slave? And this time they killed him. And they must think, well, now certainly he gets the picture. He can't send anyone else. But Jesus says, and so with many others. It's unbelievable. Some they beat, some they killed. These men are undoubtedly thinking there's something wrong with this landlord. Why is he sending these men to them, knowing what's going to happen? The next verse just makes it unbelievable. Verse 6, he still had one other, a beloved son. A son in whom he loved. Finally, they sent, he sent him. And he said, those tenants, they're going to respect my son. Those men would be saying, no one in their right mind would send their son, let alone a beloved son. What's going on with the landlord that he's sending these tenants These people, even his own son, the son that he loves. Evidently, the landlord has some hope that these men are going to repent and change, that they're going to have a change of heart so that they stop acting so wickedly. For some reason, this landowner believes 
that in showing these men mercy, that they are going to, in fact, change course. But look at what happens. Verse 8, or rather verse 7. Those servants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. That kind of phrase, come, let us, it's called a cohortive phrase frequently in the Bible, signifies really wicked actions. Frequently. Especially in the Pentateuch, but elsewhere as well. For example, at Babel, come, let us build a city for ourselves. Let's make a tower. We're going to bake bricks and make a name for ourselves. Come, let us sell Joseph to the Israelites, or rather to the Ishmaelites. Come, let us get our father drunk with wine and then lay with him. Over and over and over again. What Jesus is saying is, they've hatched a really depraved plan when they say, come, let us kill him. They're scheming wickedly. And the inheritance will be ours. That is, as soon as the old man dies, as soon as the landowner is out of the picture, this is our vineyard. No one will be left to harass us. And so they took him. That is, they took this man's beloved son and they killed him and they threw him out of the vineyard like a piece of trash. Like a piece of refuse to discard. They took this landowner's, it's his land, they took his son and they murdered him and threw him out. At this point, the members of the Sanhedrin are incredulous. It's an amazing and really unbelievable story because who would do this? It's not just the depravity and wickedness of the tenants. It's it's the landlord and his willingness to keep sending people. Why would he do that? And so Jesus asks, verse 9, what will the owner of the vineyard do? This is one of those times in the Bible, and this happens pretty fairly regularly in Scripture, where somebody will tell somebody a story, but the story is really about themselves, and it becomes sort of a mic drop moment. It's similar to when, you know, maybe you've heard somebody say, I have a question, it's for a friend, but really it's it's a question about them. They just don't want to own up to it, right? There are moments in Scripture when this happens, and it's just, rhetorically, it's the most powerful moment. For example, uh, King David. David had taken Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, and although this, man, uh, this woman was Uriah's wife, he impregnated her, whether by force or not, we do not know. And then he had Uriah killed. He hatched a plan where Uriah would be sent to the front of the battlefield. The rest of the army would pull back and Uriah would be slaughtered by the enemy. He used the enemy to kill Uriah. And what you should know is that Uriah was one of the most loyal and faithful men to David that existed. Before David was uh, given the throne of Israel... When he was hiding in a cave from Saul, fearing his life, Uriah was standing by his side, protecting him. Uriah had been with David that entire time. But David steals his wife, has him killed. And then, after Uriah's death, shortly thereafter, he has the gall to marry Bathsheba. It's really wicked. But he thinks he got away with it. He thinks it's no big deal He's forgotten about it. And so Nathan the prophet comes to David. This would happen frequently because kings were expected to hold court and to judge different matters in society, different cases and things. And so David likely thinks that, well, Nathan's just bringing me one more case to judge. Nathan tells him a story about a family that had a little ewe lamb. They didn't have a lot of money or a lot of possessions, but they really loved this lamb. They treated it like a member of the family. They cared for it. They fed it with their own hands. 
They even let it sleep in their house. The children loved it. It was a beloved pet. But they had a neighbor, this very rich man who was greedy and selfish, and he had a guest come by. So he went in, stole the the ewe lamb that was so precious to the family, had it slaughtered, and then fed it to his guest because he was too cheap to provide something of his own. Nathan tells this story to David, and David is so indignant. He says, I'm going to cut that man to pieces. He doesn't know what's coming toward him. And Nathan says, you're the man. And as a result, David is struck with the realization of the weight of his sin, and David responds in repentance. This parable is a you're the man moment. Jesus is talking about these leaders. The story is about them. And when he asks, what will the owner of the vineyard do? What he's saying is, what will God do to you on that day? He will destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. They've caught on by this point. God established the nation of Israel by taking a bunch of loosely affiliated slaves and making them a superpower in their region. Where they eliminated the threat of, at that point, the world's only lone superpower, Egypt, brought them out of there with a mighty hand and many miracles, and placed them in a land of their own, establishing them as a nation giving them the worship and the priesthood and all of the blessings that come from being God's covenant people. He gave them everything they needed, protected them from their enemies, gave them conquest over other lands, gave them good kings. And when they went astray, he even gave them prophets. And more often than not, they murdered the prophets because they couldn't tolerate what the prophets were saying. They treated the prophets shamefully. They mocked them, derided them, and quite often murdered them. They even murdered Amos at the temple. Can you imagine? They killed God's spokesman at the temple. To be a prophet meant that you had a short life expectancy. And so these men that God had ordained to this kind of ministry, they would go and boldly proclaim usually repentance and forgiveness. And the people of Israel would never tolerate their teaching. So it was with the last of the prophets, namely John. And now God has sent his son. And the great irony is that these are churchmen. These are clergymen. These are men who allegedly have given their life over to the service of God. And God is standing right in front of them, telling them what's going to happen to them. And their hearts are so hard that they don't care. Jesus says, God's going to destroy you. This is what's going to happen. He's going to come, destroy the tenants, and give the vineyard to others. Put a pin in that, we'll come back to it. And then Jesus says this, verse 10, Have you not read this scripture? Think about who Jesus is talking to here. Men who have spent their entire lives studying the Bible. They know the Bible like no one else, but Jesus has the temerity to say, Have you not read this scripture? And he quotes Psalm 118. Psalm 118, by the way, is the psalm that was mentioned at the triumphal entry. Hosanna. That comes from Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the same psalm. Jesus says, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. What Jesus is saying is that he, as God's Son, is the foundation of the kingdom of God and what God will do in the future. And ancient building practices, the cornerstone was usually the first stone laid, and it was the singularly most important stone laid in a building. 
Uh, the cornerstone was generally the largest. You would lay that stone, and that stone would set the trajectory for the rest of the building project. Jesus says, I'm the cornerstone of the church. He's the foundation. He determines the, the, tra- the trajectory for the kingdom of God. Look at verse 12, their response there, seeking to arrest him. But they feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. That's a consistent theme in this, in this whole swath of the last couple of chapters of Mark. These men fear the people. Whereas the Bible tells us, don't fear people, fear God... These men don't fear God and fear people. They are cowards. Learn from these men. The fear of man will drive you to depraved things. You know, the Bible never once supports the idea that you're to fear men, except in the case of governing authorities. It's the only time. Every other time the Bible tells us Fear God, not man. And what's the worst that man can do? Steal your property, kill you? God says he'll reverse all that. Whatever they take away from you, whatever they do wrong, one day he's going to hit the button and everything will be given back to you. And it won't just be given back to you in terms of what you lost. It'll be given back to you a hundredfold. If you live the life of faith. Whatever people steal from you, whatever they take away from you, he will restore. The proof of that is the empty tomb. Now, think about what Jesus said in verse 9. He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Who are the others? Well, routinely in the Old Testament... The nation of Israel is described as God's vineyard. It's one of the metaphors God uses to describe his people. He's going to take the vineyard and give it to others. The others here are those who make up God's church, which are predominantly Gentiles. And so we might say, in summary, the others here are the Gentiles. This is a very similar sentiment to what Paul says in Romans chapter 11 when he talks about the Gentiles having been grafted into the vine and the Jews being cut off. We've been grafted in by the sovereign work of God. We're also told in Romans 11 that there will come a time when God will, in fact, bring back the Jews, when there will be a great revival and a great harvest among uh, those Jewish people. But the Gentiles are in the covenant by way of grafting. And Jesus here referenced it, we're the others. Similar to what Jesus says when he says, I have other sheep, not in this fold. That's you and me if you're a Gentile today. Now, I have two important implications from all of this. Two important points of application. The first is, as I mentioned last week, these men do not have an intellectual objection to the ministry of Christ. Rather, they have a moral problem in that they are subject to a strong delusion... That strong delusion is to protect themselves, their interests, their place of prominence, even at the expense of Jesus' life. It is a dangerous thing to come into this building every single week and to hear the Word of God and to hear the Gospel week after week after week, like these men, many of whom serve in the temple. Think about that. God's in the building, and they're still lost. It is a dangerous thing to come in this building and to sit under the Word of God and to walk out those doors not having peace with God. And if you do that, 
you are storing up for yourself wrath that you cannot possibly imagine. You come here every single week and you don't know Christ. And you think in your mind that you've got some sin that you want to hang on to or that Christianity doesn't fit in with your life or whatever lame excuse you have. And then you're going to come to a day where Christ is going to be standing before you in victorious judgment. An eternity separated from God awaits you. And you made it worse for yourself by coming in this building every week. Maybe you sang hymns. Maybe you came to worship. Maybe you're even a member of this church. But you really don't know him. And I pray for you hoping that you're not like that. But I know that there will be people like that on that day. Jesus says so in Matthew chapter 7. He says, On that day when I will commence my judgment, many will come to me saying, Lord, Lord, we did this in your name, and we did that in your name. We did many mighty works in your name. They even got the lingo down. They're calling him Lord. They did all of these things, they claim. Maybe they did. Maybe they volunteered in ten different ways. Even so, he says, depart from me. Leave my presence because I never knew you. The irony of coming so close to salvation and walking away from it is unbelievable that people do this. It's unbelievable to me that there are people who will play the role and even take the Lord's Supper, even undergo baptism, and still not know Him. You're better off not coming here if that's you. Because you are storing up for yourself wrath that you cannot possibly comprehend. The only thing I can tell you, if that is you, and you know it in your heart, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to humble yourself. Today is the day when God offers you peace and eternal life. If you will but repent and come to Him in faith. And you put your trust in Christ and stop playing the games any longer. These men devoted their lives to God, allegedly. They did so many things for God. They were experts in the Bible. What that means is that you can be an expert in the Bible and be lost. You can sing hymns and go to hell. You can evangelize other people and end up in judgment. This is not about the things you do. Allegedly for Christ. This is about a relationship with the living God that is based on what Jesus has achieved for you. And so you need to get right with him if that's you. A second implication. In 70 AD, which is a few decades after Jesus ascended to the right hand of God, What Jesus describes here in terms of the judgment of God upon the nation of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, and the system of Judaism came to pass. Just as Jesus says in Matthew's gospel, this generation shall not pass until all these things come to pass. In 70 AD, God used the Romans to destroy the nation of Israel, to destroy the city of Jerusalem, to destroy the temple, and to destroy Judaism. The Judaism that exists today is absolutely nothing like the Judaism of Jesus' day. Judaism as it existed then doesn't exist any longer. It can exist any longer. When the temple was sacked, and indeed not one stone was left upon another, every bit of the Jewish archive that identified your heredity as a Jew identified what tribe you belong to, that was all destroyed. 
So today, Jews don't know if they're uh, from the tribe of Levi or from the tribe of Gad or from the tribe of, of Benjamin. They have no idea. So the priesthood is impossible in Judaism. That's why there are no priests. That's why there isn't a temple. Don't you think that if they could, they would build a third temple? But you can't. Why? Because God definitively destroyed that religion. And let me just let you in on an important fact. Do you know that the Bible says that the Messiah had to come when the second temple was still standing? In Daniel chapter 9, God says the Messiah is going to come when that second temple is there in Jerusalem. And so the window was between Ezra and Nehemiah in 70 AD. And there's only one candidate that fits the description. And he strolled out of the tomb, defeating death, proving it that he was it. This Judaism that exists today is, in the scheme of things, novel. It is new. It is new in the sense that it bears very little resemblance to the Judaism of the Old Covenant. There are no priests. There are no sacrifices. There are no offerings. Instead, what you have are a bunch of relatively new, relatively, in terms of Judaism, new practices designed by rabbis to serve as substitutes for the actual religion of Judaism. So when you talk to a friend about Christ who is a practicing Jew, and there are different versions of Judaism that range from very conservative, in terms of Hasidic Judaism and Orthodox Judaism, to very liberal, in terms of Reformed and conservative Judaism. I know that's confusing, but yes, conservative Judaism is fairly liberal. When you talk to your friend who is wrapped up in the Jewish religion, religion as it exists today, bear in mind that what they're practicing has no continuity with what is described in the Old Testament. It has no continuity. They're not just a little off. They're worshiping something completely different. Which means that since we were grafted in that we have an obligation to the people of Israel, meaning the modern state of Israel. There should be a special place in your heart for the Jew. Because God has a covenant promise still to fulfill in their lives. That he will one day end the age of the Gentiles as it is known. That is, God giving the vineyard over to others. And he will one day call the Jew back to himself. And I want you to know that there is a movement afoot right now in the nation of Israel, whereas previously missionary work was notoriously impossible in Israel. There is a movement right now for the past 10 years where unprecedented numbers of Jews are coming to Christ. It's been going on for a decade now. It's been steadily increasing. And so we may be on the verge of seeing a move of God among those people. And indeed, that is something we should be praying for. A natural implication of this is that we support the modern state of Israel as a Christian obligation. Not because the modern state of Israel has something to do with ancient Israel. It doesn't. Don't read Nation of Israel in the Bible and look at the modern state of Israel and think they're the same thing. They're not the same thing. They have the same name. That's about as far as the similarity goes. But they're a democracy, and they're people that God has said he will one day redeem. And so, as people who care very much about the promises of God in this new covenant, we support the Jew, because salvation came to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, also to the Gentile. We must have a a pro-Israel mindset, not in terms of rubber stamping everything that nation does. Let's be honest, that nation is by and large godless. It's a huge exporter of pornography and drugs. But God will one day redeem them. And let's pray that it's in our lifetime. I hope you'll think about these things. 
Uh, let us pray.